Welcome to Global Health Insights, a podcast at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, or IHME. I'm Pauline Chu in Media Relations. In this episode, we're going to be discussing maternal mortality in the United States. Researchers at IHME and Mass General Brigham conducted a study analyzing 20 years of maternal mortality data from 1999 to 2019 of five racial and ethnic groups in every single state. What were the findings? Well, we're gonna dive deep into that. But the general findings are that there are still high rates of mothers dying during pregnancy or within the year after giving birth. The numbers were the highest in the black population. And we saw the largest increase of, in Native American Indian and the Alaska Native population. Now for this discussion, we have authors of the study, Dr. Greg Roth, cardiologist and associate professor in cardiology and director of the program in cardiovascular health metrics at IHME. And we also have Dr. Allison Bryant, an obstetrician and associate chief health equity officer at Mass General Brigham. And we have Professor Monica McLemore, who was not part of the research in this study, but on top of all the issues surrounding maternal mortality, she's professor in the Department of Child, Family and Population Health Nursing at University of Washington, and also a board member of Black Mamas Matter Alliance. Thank you to all three of you for being part of this podcast and this important discussion. Welcome. Thank you for having us. Thanks. First, I want to start with the policy impact this study has already had since its publication. Now, since it was published in the Journal of uh, American Medicine Association, or JAMA, several U.S. senators from New Jersey, Georgia, California, have reintroduced a bill to decrease bias and discrimination in maternal health. And they specifically cite this study that was recently published. So uh, Dr. Bryant and Dr. Roth, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. And Dr. Bryant, let me start with you. When you saw that your study lit this spark to reintroduce this bill, what were your thoughts? Thanks, Pauline. I would say I think it's a long time in coming, and I'm glad that this work is sort of energizing some of this work in the policy space, but it really is long overdue. So I'm excited that folks are thinking about, you know, what's been going on in the country and how really devastating these rates are and what each state can do in terms of legislative action to make change. And, and Dr. Roth, this must have been exciting news for you to hear. In general, what do, does each state need to do? What would you like to see next? Yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about this. Uh, I mean, it's important work because we think that creating this evidence base, creating the data to really show where we've been and where we're headed is a key step in leading to change. You know, states are obviously realizing that they can't ignore this. Um, and, you know, both at the federal level and at the state level, we expect to see legislation passed uh, that reflects, you know, this really important health crisis that, you know, has you know, clear uh, implications for what we need to do with our health systems and our public health systems. And Professor McLemore, uh, you've spoken about maternal mortality and you've written about it for years. Uh, you've said that most of the deaths and you pointed out most of the deaths are preventable. So talk to us about prenatal and postnatal care and what's missing and what these policymakers really need to act on. Well, let me, first of all, thank you for having me and, and remind everyone that the Black Maternal Caucus, which is led by Rep. Alma Adams uh, and Rep. Lauren Underwood, who's also a nurse, they've introduced the Momnibus three years in a row. Um, and in fact, it was introduced the Tuesday before lockdown during COVID-19. It was reintroduced after the insurrection on January 6th. So we've actually had legislation that has been pending. So it's very exciting to have evidence-based you know, policy that is being reintroduced, but I don't want listeners to not think that people have not tried to bring some attention to these issues, including the work of Black Moments Matter Alliance. Uh, let me also say in 2018, I published a piece in Scientific American about the preventable Black maternal deaths, and that we really needed to do uh, some very structural things to improve outcomes. First of all, we know maternal deaths mostly happen in the postpartum period or, at, or once the pregnancy has resolved. And that is the time where we at least have our eyes on, on pregnant capable people and postpartum people. So when the reproductive trajectory resets is the time when we're at least looking at individuals. And then second of all, I, I think that from a state by state perspective, especially post-Dobbs, 
we are really starting to understand the loss or the lack of support for pregnant capable people, regardless of how pregnancies end, and that that is being a real patchwork of policies, procedures, and services that are available to pregnant capable people. So I think it, it, it's spawning a broader conversation for us to start to synergize and coordinate our effort. And, and to continue that conversation, Dr. Roth, you are a cardiologist. So help us understand the intersectionality between cardiovascular disease and maternal mortality and, and what Professor McElmore had, had mentioned, which is uh, the postpartum period and what signs may be, may be missed. Yeah, I mean, this is something really important for people to understand. When we look at maternal mortality in lower resource countries outside of the United States, a lot of attention has been paid to um, bleeding at the time of delivery um, or infections. Um, and while those are problems in the United States as well, there's a very large proportion of maternal deaths in the United States that are due essentially to what we think of as vascular diseases, blood clots and uh, high blood pressure that can become dangerous and even life-threatening during pregnancy and can have problems after pregnancy as well. And so when we think of the risks that lead to the cardiovascular problems in older adults, blood clots in the heart, um, strokes, heart failure, and those kinds of conditions, we see that a lot of the same risks are driving these terrible events amongst younger pregnant women, um, either during their pregnancy or postpartum. And so there's a real intersection between vascular or cardiac or heart health and maternal health. And that's something that we need to pay more attention to. And Dr. Bryant, is that generally known throughout the, uh, in terms of maternal care throughout the U.S., or are there signs that are missed all the time? I think it depends on who you talk with. I think for many of us who've been thinking about this problem for a long time, yes, we have definitely recognized that there are signs and symptoms that we are not hearing our patients tell us, and so that, and that may be different by who the patient is. Um, but there are probably educational gaps, both on the patient and family side, we can do a better job from the healthcare system about giving warning signs to individuals about what to call back for, but also on the side of healthcare providers and also on the side of policymakers who need to cover, you know, healthcare for that period of time that is so vulnerable for many of our individuals. Let's dive into the study. There's so much to read. And, you know, when your study was published, our department got so many calls from state reporters just wanting to dive into the granular part of their state data. So let's talk about the regions and groups. And you compared the first decade to the second decade when we look at 1999 to 2019. Let's just take the black population to start. Louisiana, New Jersey, Georgia, Arkansas, Texas, those states individually saw more than a 93% increase in maternal deaths when you compared those two decades. American Indian and Alaska Native population, Florida, Kansas, Illinois, Rhode Island, Wisconsin, saw more than 162% increase. So Dr. Bryant, what is happening here that things are not getting better? I think what's happening here is structural racism is happening here and it has been happening here for all of this time and we have not systematically addressed that whether within our healthcare system or our criminal justice system or our systems of education so we are all on the hook for what we've been seeing and so I think that you know we spend a lot of time in healthcare thinking about social determinants of health as sort of approximate cause of sort of poor health outcomes things like poor nutrition or education or transportation but I think we all have to recognize that those things are differentially applied by population because of policies that are have structural racism built in. And so if we don't fix those policies, we really can't expect that we're going to see a difference. And so I think that that largely explains why we have this perpetuation of these inequities over time. And Professor McElmore, um, what are your thoughts about why this is happening? And we, we did not see an, a, a, an improvement in the second decade of this study. Um, and I'd also like you to talk about just the simple act of listening. Well, I, I completely agree with Dr. Bryant, and I want to add two other pieces to this, right? I mean, we know that insurance access, you know, improves health outcomes. And so when we have employer-sponsored health insurance versus public insurance versus if you're lucky enough, the job that offers you benefits, like, the, this, what we, I want to connect the dots around what we say structural racism showing up in healthcare, right? I also want to sort of bring forward this notion that if we are all in conflict, if the healthcare 
team is in conflict. There's a workforce issue, right? So to Dr. Bryant's point around not listening or not believing people or not hearing their stories or having people repeatedly come back for assessments being sent home because they're using either different language or, you know, our staffing is oversubscribed or whatever. It, these are structural problems, right? So as much as I appreciate the, you know, focus on the cardiovascular events, because all of that is true, we also have to look at more upstream factors, right? I mean, if you're constantly in a state of weathering where you're always in fight or flight because you're wondering whether or not you're going to be heard or listened to or served or surveilled by the police or whatever it is, then you're not going to have superior outcomes during pregnancy and childbirth. That's just, that is not possible. So this idea that we're not listening to pregnant capable people, I would also argue in the same way that uh, my good colleague, Dr. Uh, Kimberly Seals Allers always says, we have enough, we have a, a lot to learn from black maternal lives mm -hmm. in as much as we do black maternal deaths. Right, And so as we start to think about these data and policies, it's one thing to be informed by deaths that are occurring, but like, where are the interventions that are working? We talk about midwifery care and doulas and all this other support, but like, we also, I think we focus a little bit too much on deaths and not the lessons that we could be learning from, you know, black pregnant capable people's lives and listening to them about what they need, about how to engage, and to really hear the language and and the the you know ideas that they have about approving this problem, I think is the only way we're actually going to see any real change. So, can you give us some examples so we can pursue that that line of thought of interventions that are working? You've Absolutely. got the years of policymakers now, so to help us understand. Absolutely, I talk about this. Yeah, I talk about this all the time. One real simple one, Dr. Bryan has already suggested, why can't we extend everybody's insurance coverage irrespective of who's paying for it in the postpartum period if we already know that 42% of the deaths are estimated in that time point? Why can't we come up with community-based models to know what to be doing in that actual year of extended of coverage as opposed to just addressing clinical issues? Why can't we address social ones? Why can't we give people a basic minimum income so that they have the money for the food and the transportation and all the sort of negative social determinants of health? There have been, what, three different regional pilot projects to provide people unrestricted money during pregnancy and childbirth. And we see in those regions improved outcomes. I mean, it's can not we, rocket science, right? Can to, we look at, go ahead. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, can we look at other countries that are doing it? better. I mean, we're the only high income country with this kind of maternal mortality rate. We can, but there's another point to be made there once we do that. The outcomes, you know, despite the fact that we didn't see the same magnitude of, of increase in white populations, right? The outcomes of white people in the United States still are not the best that we can get in the world. Right. So I, I always caution us to think about this notion that what are the other constellation of services that are in place in other countries that complicate these data? Right. Not to say that there are no structural racism in those countries. There is. But there are mitigating factors like having a robust social safety net, paid family leave, you know, insurance coverage throughout, you know, from womb to tomb that actually are associated with improved outcomes. So to, to continue to compare ourselves to, you know, white populations in the United States actually isn't even the best outcomes that we could get globally. But we have to have the political will and the courage to actually say we want to care for our citizens and actually do the things that we know that work in other countries to improve pregnancy-related outcomes. Dr. Roth, one way to to push for better outcomes through policy is really to have better data. And in terms of data gathering, when you were doing the research, were there data gaps that were apparent? And what would you suggest in terms of in terms of getting better data state to the state? Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing is it's really important to try and get data at the level that decision making happens. And so one of our goals in health metrics is really to try and align the information, the evidence base that we're creating with the decision makers and what they need. And so there's, you know, there's been no lack of data on maternal mortality in the United States. This is a well studied area for a very long time. So what did we do differently? Well, we actually produced estimates at the level of 
every single state in a way that was consistent and comparable so that you could easily look from one state to the nut to another and know that those numbers were produced the same way constructed the same way and could be directly compared to each other the other thing is we produced a really long time series so the state level estimates that have been produced by the government have been for single years or for short periods of time we think it's really important to understand this long history in in data and then finally, we looked within states. And so we took that subgroup of, of race or ethnic population within every state, and we did the same thing. So they could be compared across states and also within states. And I think that's why we've seen so much of a response, both from the media and from government, is because we're actually finally dialing in on the kind of information that really helps them understand, okay, we need to do something about this now. So that's that's part, about, uh, part of adapting our scientific efforts to really inform policy. And I think that's a key step. We have to imagine how to change policy from the very beginning of the design of our research projects. Um, but I think there's still gaps. You know, We see maternal mortality review committees, which are just such an important part of how data is collected in many states, but we don't see them in every single state. We don't see consistent, similar reporting from all of those. So some do very, very good job um, and others, there are gaps or there are resource limitations. And I'll just point out that Politically, some of these committees have had their reports suppressed uh, in some states. And in fact, some of these committees have been disbanded or defunded in some states. So there's an interaction with you know, the political will to support high quality disease surveillance, which is how we make this evidence happen, um, and you know, what we actually see happening. Are you able to identify or, or help us understand or recognize where these committees or the, some of these reports are suppressed? or defunded uh, to any of anyone on the panel? I think well, there was the example. So go ahead. No, go ahead, Dr. Bryant. No, I think that there was the example, I think, earlier um, this year in Texas, in which so Texas is a state that has a sort of mandatory release of a report once a year, and there was um, a delay in the repeats of that report. So ultimately, the state did release the report, but there were concerns that the data were insufficient. But I think that there was some concern that that was indeed politically motivated. And so I think we need to move the politics out of this. Um, and But that was, I think, one example where we're concerned that those data were starting to be um, suppressed. One of the reasons why we're so glad that we've been able to publish in the Journal of the American Medical Association is because we've produced really um, sort of gold standard, completely transparent set of estimates. We do that in the health metrics field all the time where we follow a reporting guideline um, and we make all of the information and all of our methods completely available and available on the web. Um, and so we really wanna raise the bar for evidence and we wanna make sure that everybody understands that these numbers are accurate, they're reliable, they're robust. And to your point, Dr. Roth, we make the data sets available to the media and to the public. And so if anyone asks, we can make it available. Thank you for being part of this very important discussion. Uh, we see that it's generated a ton of interest from policymakers to the media. So congratulations on an impactful study. And Dr. Roth, Dr. Allison Bryant, and Professor Monica McLemore, thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. Thank you for having us. Thanks very much.